ICQ Podcast episode 337, announcing Homebrew Hero 2020. Well, hello and welcome fellow Amatam radio enthusiasts to this, our 337th episode of the ICQ Amateur Ham Radio podcast, supported by our monthly and annual subscription donors. In this episode, Martin M1MRB is joined by Leslie Golf Zero, Charlie India Bravo, Dan Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, Edmund Mike Zero, Mike November Golf, and Matthew Mike Zero, November Julia X Ray to discuss this Amateur Ham Radio news. Myself, Colin, M6BRY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is the announcement of the Homebrew Hero 2020 Award. Well, as always, it's our very kind donors that keep this uh, podcast as ever free, and uh, we'd like to thank our subscription donors uh, who provide some sustaining funds to uh, help us uh, pay our way, our hosting costs, etc., and, as I say, keep the show advert free. You can show your value for the show by uh, taking up one of the many options that you can find on icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. Well, as I say, whatever value you find in the show and send our way helps us continue to produce the show. Now we're off to join Martin, Leslie, Dan and Edmund, uh, along with Matthew returning. Uh, and uh, they're going to discuss and generate thoughts about the latest amateur ham radio news, including new optical communication station and opposing the FCC fees. As always, hope you enjoy. The ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast, serving the amateur ham radio community fortnightly since 2008. Hi guys and welcome to episode 337 of the ICQ Podcast and tonight's news round table. Tonight we're joined by Mr Leslie Butterfield, G-Series CIB. Hi Leslie. Good evening, Martin, and thank you for inviting me again. It's always a blast. It's to have you, mate, and uh, we'll we'll have some fun, I'm sure. Moving the other side of the pond, we have Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU. Hi, Dan. Howdy from the US. Yeah, great to have you. Back to the UK, I've got Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MMG. Hi, Edmund. Hello, Martin. Hello, everybody. Hi, mate. No, it's uh, great to have you on board. And... Back after must be seven or eight months of lockdown and hidden away in Spain, we have Mr. Mastin Yassau, M0NJX. Hi, Matthew. Hola, hola. Hello. Yes, uh, <laughs> thanks for having me back. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a long time, and I'm very, very happy to be here. That's good news. Good to have you back and say we missed you. Right, moving uh, to our first news story. We have uh, Optical Communications, a new station going to be set up down there in Western Australia. Uh, Matthew, do you want to go first on this one? Uh, Yeah, so I I, honestly, I'd never heard of this sort of free space laser communications methodology or or, or technology that uh, was was outlined. Uh, The article goes on to describe how the the University of Western Australia is going to set up a, a small test uh, site or test uh, in- installation to uh, use optical uh, laser communications with low Earth op- uh, orbit objects as far away as the Moon, in fact. Uh, so the the distances can be pretty uh, pretty impressive. So I, I've been, as we were recording, I was trying to find the details around the subject uh, to to talk about. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's quite a it's quite an, a, a feat. I remember. Um, during the, the Apollo missions when they placed reflectors on the surface of the moon and then with firing lasers from an observatory on Earth and trying to measure various things about the moon, like the Earth moonquakes distance and stuff like that. But the, the detectors on Earth only ever recorded like 10 or 20 photons at a time coming back. The, the, the count was, was, uh, was very low. And that's um, a function of the atmospheric you know, disturbances and, and, uh, and so on. So uh, it seems that they they've they've uh, are ready to, to address that techno you know that that technical challenge in the next uh, uh, that that's happened over the past twenty or thirty years. They say that the university has a uh, uh, a way of countering the atmospheric disturbances between the Earth and these low Earth orbit objects. So uh, uh, it sounds like a you know a pretty impressive 
uh, test run, although it does seem to be a fairly established technology as well. Uh, so I'm learning something today. Yeah, well, I think it's an interesting technology. Dan, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, yeah, so this is uh, pretty interesting. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, they really want to uh, extend the range at some point, like to, to Mars or even farther. And uh, I would suppose at that point, they'd really want the receiving station to be outside the Earth at Earth's atmosphere. But, yeah, it's uh, they're pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, well, you might get your Earth, Mars Earth uh, contact in from this one. Oh, yeah, there you go. Somebody could uh, win that Elser Mathis Cup with light waves instead of radio waves. Well, as long as it's a two-way communications, that would work, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Edmund, what's your thoughts on this one? It's fascinating stuff, isn't it? I know that communication via light waves has been around for very many decades but my first thought on hearing about this was what uh, has just been touched on there how well would the the signal penetrate through the earth's atmosphere with all the diffraction and cloud and uh, other dust and stuff that's up there because these are, are nanometric wavelengths aren't they so very, very short indeed. But if they can overcome that one, this is a system I would love to see being demonstrated and actually in operation. Martin, back to you. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah interesting. It's not amateur, but it's certainly interesting. Leslie, your thoughts on this one? I'm just reading, trying to go through the story with interest. If anyone's interested, there's a, a site called www.itnews.com.au. And it's this this story is, is on their website. It talks about and are expected to drastically improve transfer capabilities at improved data transfer capabilities from space. I it, not sure it doesn't actually give any specific figures there, but it's certainly a very very interesting story. I mean, like like was said earlier, optical uh, communications has, have been around for quite some time. I'd like to see where this one goes. It, it, see, see what it can do. Well, I think, uh, as I say, it, it's something new and something interesting that's happening in the radio world. So that's quite nice. Right, moving to our next news story. WSJT-X developer, that's Joe Taylor, expresses puzz puzzlement over FT8 use in contest. Now... We're not big contesters. We're not big FT8 users. But, so bear with us on this one. But uh, certainly Joe Taylor seems to think it's a bit strange. Edmund, what's your thoughts? Well, I agree with him, given that FT4 was developed expressly for contests. It uh, does have a disadvantage relative to FT8 that there's a 3 dB difference. But on the other hand, the advantage is that the transmissions take uh, half the time. So unless you had real die-hard extreme DX chasing contesters who would value the 3 dB difference above the, the halving in time, I would have thought that it would have made sense for people just to use FT4, which it was specially made for. So, yes, I, I share Joe Taylor's puzzlement, uh, Martin, and I should uh, add as a disclaimer, I have still yet to have in any contact using FT8 on any band, and I've certainly never used uh, FT4. Right, right, no problems at all there. Well, Dan, I think you've used FT8, and you do a little bit of contesting, but mainly more, shouldn't it, Dan? Oh, yeah, for me, it's most, mostly voice code. So I think a couple of things might be going on here. Um, one, there may be something about the way FT4 is implemented that contesters just don't like for some reason. I don't know, maybe, you know, you have to use the WSJTX software, and maybe they just don't like it. Another thing is, is that, um, you know, contests, you have to make as many contacts as you can. If people aren't on FT4, well, they're not there to make contacts with. 
so you don't use it and then you get a vicious circle right no not enough people using it so no people are going to use it which means fewer people are going to use it etc etc so uh you know it could be uh, any of those things i think yeah this as you say there's a lot of reasons why it might not have been used leslie i know you're not really in big into the data have you got anything to comment uh, on this one I'm not a data person. I'm not a contest person. So I'm going to duck out of this one, Martin, if you don't mind. Yeah, it. yeah we'll, leave, we'll leave you. You just put your tin out on again and we'll leave oh, you in I the know. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Matthew, any thoughts on this one? Well, I, I'd, I think I'd agree with Dan. Uh, it might be a chicken and the egg. You know, people aren't using it, therefore it doesn't get used, therefore people don't use it, and so on. Uh, I'd never heard of FT4. Uh, before reading the article shows you again my put my hands up that i'm not a digital uh user but uh it seems to me as sort of a in contests you want to have the shortest call sign you can have you want to have the loudest uh station you can have um you want to have be the quickest so you, you want to minimize any any qso time as much as possible and you and repeat and just keep doing it over and over and over i guess yeah uh, if there was a dedicated mode designed with the intent of having shorter QSOs specifically for Q contesters where by nature the 599 thank you QRZ is is almost a default mantra uh, to identify a contester I'm surprised it's not being used more actively uh, and so uh, yeah maybe 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 there are more subtle reasons secondary factors involved it could just be visibility of the mode people just don't know it Right. Well, I think it's interesting, and I think Joe Taylor raised some uh, very good points on this one. So, uh, we'll we'll keep an eye on this one. Uh, we co almost covered this news story about four weeks ago with this group, uh, where the FCC were proposing uh, new fees. I, I and... think this is the story where we have to clean the blood off the carpet, Martin. Yeah, yeah. I'll get you a steamer, and <laughs> you can sort of steam it off later. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, this is now the AWRL urging the members to strongly oppose this. I'm not so sure. Go on, Leslie, you go first on this one. Oh, uh, what can I say, Martin? Well, I'm, I'm going to put the cat amongst the pigeons here. We used to be in this country, and I'm, I'm talking from a, a, a UK's perspective. Uh, when I joined the hobby, we were charged about £8 a year. And then over the years, I think it went up to £15. And the licensing authority at the time sort of looked at what they were collecting and looked at the cost of collecting it and said, no, they, want, they wanted to change it. That was understandable. Um, so they, they come through a system where you, you register, re, you re-register your call sign, update it. That's the word I was looking for. You update it, and that lasts five years, but it doesn't actually cost you anything. However, the flip side of that, and I know there was lots and lots of arguments at the time, is how can you expect a service, any service, when you're not paying for it? And you're not really in a position to claim, uh, to complain about it. And so that's, that's sort of where we are at the moment. And um, I, I think if people are handing over good money for a service, that sort of changes people's mindset a bit. And there is a thing about, uh, you know, the, the cost of coming into the hobby. Well, I, I'd stand up again and say, look, guys, it's it's never been cheaper today to get into the hobby. If you look at the 1980s, a handheld was about £180. A HF set would, would be about £1,000. Now today, in 2020, a HF set, brand new out of the box, much higher specification will still cost about a thousand pounds you can get a second hand one to get on hf for a couple of hundred but so it's it's a lot lot cheaper to get into the hobby. even handhelds now you can buy them for about 15 pounds you know so i, I wouldn't complain about this uh, i'd say you know uh, if you if you hand over money there's going to be an expectation that uh, they, they give a service and and that's a, that's a good thing that's my penny's worth. I know everyone's not going to accept that, but hey. Well, I think you're right. There comes a cost of joining the hobby, and whatever you do, there's a cost. You know, if you, uh, whatever hobby it is, there's some form of cost, and it just depends whether you're serious on that hobby. 
Dan, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, I kind of think it's a foregone conclusion. You know, this this fee, although there's some debate about the actual legal wording of the law, the, the, this is being mandated by Congress to charge licensees a license fee. And um, I just think it's kind of a foregone conclusion. And that being the case, I think, you know, we as ham radio operators should uh, try and figure out a way to uh, – defray that cost if we can for people that are really seriously in in uh, in need of it yes absolutely yeah you know and i'll i'll volunteer myself to uh, uh pay the fee or help pay the fee of uh, uh some kid you know who wants to get into the hobby you know i'll they can show me that they they uh, can't afford the 50 bucks i'll be happy to uh, to pay the fee for them so uh but yeah i think it's a foregone conclusion and and you know, there's a another another issue here is whether or not we should be sort of wasting our political capital trying to fight something that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, you know, maybe our our political capital is better spent uh, trying to fight uh, homeowner agreements uh, uh, restricting antennas or something along those lines. But I don't know. the The story here actually is is that this uh, you know when we covered it four weeks ago, the FCC said they were thinking about doing it. Now this is an actual uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. So it's gone to the next step. And it's at this step that uh, you're allowed to actually comment on it with the FCC. And that's what the ARRL is saying here is everybody should, every ARRL member and ham radio operator in the U.S. should comment on it. So that, that's the that's what the story is here, the, the further story. And, uh, you know, the way, the way uh, t- you know, talk about getting service for money, well, you know, before you used to actually have to mail your, uh, your comments in when the, the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking has come up. Well, now the FCC has a nice online uh, system, so you can do it all online. So uh, you're getting something for, for, your, for nothing, I guess, <laughs> not having, a, having the current uh, fee system, uh, no, no current fee for an amateur radio license. Yeah, that's good. Matthew, your thoughts on this one? Uh, well, I, you know, it, 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 it looks like a tax, doesn't it? Like you go from zero to 50 bucks uh, and everyone's up in uproar. But I think as Dan mentioned, this is the outcome of legislation that's happened in the past two years. Maybe the specific number itself hadn't been widely known or hadn't been published in, in the past couple of months. It's now a number that to be debated. But it's it's uh, the only the only question in my mind is people are um, reacting to this ARL's call for action urge urge to write to your local FCC office and say no thank you, uh, but but that reaction is is either um, because the number itself wasn't clearly you know maybe people thought it might be twenty bucks now it's fifty bucks so that's a bigger jump than we expected maybe that's something we can we can comment on, but um, I, I don't. From, from what I understand from the outside looking in and listening to Dan's comments, this is this has been telegraphed to the to the hobby. It's happening. Um, and you know, the number is five zero. Uh, and you know, five dollars it's about five dollars for a, every year of your subscription for a ten year license. It's not that expensive in the in the bigger scheme of things, right? Matthew? Yeah. The one the one thing I would be careful of and, and I'm mindful where I, where I'm from is uh, being a Brit, is that I, I can't mention the word tax because the last time we put a tax on tea, the Americans got ever so upset about it. Yeah, you had to raise that one, didn't you? I, I know. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh, no problems. Hey, but what's your thoughts on this one? Well, several thoughts. First of all, Leslie is correct about amateur radio never having been cheaper in real terms than it is today. Uh, a major amateur radio retailer in the UK puts videos online uh, on a weekly basis. And in a couple of them, he has mentioned that in 2020, he's selling an FT818. So an all, all mode, all band shack in a box QRP for not much more money than he was selling a dual band two meter 70 centimeter handheld for uh, some 25 years ago so 
I agree with what Leslie says. Yes, it's re- it, in real terms, it's never been cheaper. Secondly, I would almost caution the FCC to be to be careful what it wishes for, notwithstanding the comment about Congress being the the people who've instigated this, because as soon as a person hands over any amount of money, even if it's something trivial like um, a cent a year or something like that, as soon as you part with your hard-earned cash, there will be an expectation of something in return or a service. Absolutely, absolutely. So the FCC could be making a rod for its own back here. And if Ofcom said to me, well, you can't expect any service because you aren't paying for an amateur radio license, my response to that would be, well, I would like a service and I would like to pay for an amateur radio license, but you are preventing me by not taking my money. So you could look at that <laughs> two ways as well. No, no um, I'm cleaning blood off the carpet, the man. <laughs> 50, $50 over 10 years, yes, it's not a lot when you break it down to dollars per year. But having said that, if you're new to the hobby, and you don't know for sure if 10 years down the line you're still going to be active or involved, then paying that as a one-off up front in full fee, I can see why that could seem rather a lot of money to pay. But then again, having said that, if $50 or £50 is a problem, a brand new Baofeng UV5R, that's what the best part of £25-£30 I think it's been a long time since I've bought one. So if you can't afford fifty pounds or dollars for the the license fee, how are you ever going to afford any of the the equipment unless you're going to rely on other people giving it to you for free? So a, a collection of random and not particularly well ordered thoughts for you there, uh, Martin. Back to you. Yeah, well, I'm going to sum out my thoughts on this one. In fairness, there's a cost to doing anything in life. There's a cost of hobby. If you're a smoker, you're paying the average of £10 a packet of 20 cigarettes. If you smoke 20 a day, it's £10 a day. Probably 12 to $13 a day for a packet of cigarettes in the UK. You'd, you know, what if you go to the pub or the bar? Yeah, you know, your drinks cost you. It's what you want to do. You know, it's we're looking at this saying, "Oh my God, they want fifty dollars off us." But in fairness, for us that are serious in the hobby, or anybody who's coming in new, we'll just accept that. And the whole thing is, you know, whatever you do, it's going to cost money, regardless of what hobby it is, amateur radio or not. And I don't think this is excessive, personally. So there we go. Right. This one I'm going to leave Leslie out of because it's another contesting one, and oh, I know how you. much he loves them. <laughs> I'm going to hide. <laughs> yeah, you can put your tin out on, sit in the corner. So you'll be all right. Guidelines issued for the new ARRL DX uh, contest multi-operation stations. So uh, kind of... A little bit interesting. It's a states-type story, so I'm going to pass it to Dan first. But what's your thoughts on this one, Dan? Well, I think these are uh, pretty good looking at them. Uh, it will allow uh, people who don't want to, uh, who, who normally would actually be at a multi-op station, participate from their home station. And, yeah, you know, we're all getting up there and in, the, in the high-risk group, or a lot of us are anyway. And it's probably uh, probably good to follow these guidelines. Uh, how many will actually? I don't know, but uh, you know they look like pretty common sense guidelines to me. Well, I think so, and I think that at least some somebody's put some guidelines together. Edmund, uh, you're not a contester, but does these guidelines make a little bit of sense? I'm not a contester, despite rumours of me entering a contest recently as an absolute one-off. <laughs> I'm not going to make it a habit, definitely. I always feel a bit, I don't know if wary is quite the right word on commenting on what the ARRL does or says, because I'm not a member and I live in the wrong country. I know you can become a member overseas, and one of these days I might just do oh, that yeah. very thing. 
So I haven't really looked at this in any great detail and um, I don't have any comment to make, Martin. Back to you. Right, no problems at all. Did I hear the Dinat Brigade say something? I s- <laughs> mentioned about the ARRL and being a member. I said I am. I know you are. And uh, as I say, that's, uh, we get some good books as well from the ARRL, but that's another oh, yeah, story. Definitely, definitely. I, I just like to comment. I think uh, uh, Edmund's recent success is an indicator of, of innate talent. I think, well, okay, I, I took part in the portable ops challenge contest and the thing that skewed everything in my favor was qrp if i had worked the same number of stations on the same bands but running 100 watts as opposed to five watts i would not have ended up with a score anything along the lines of what i ended up achieving so if anybody ever says to you, life is too short for QRP, you can't do it, it won't work, you might just as well not bother, the Portable Ops Challenge, which might get mentioned uh, again a bit later on in this podcast, is living proof that that is not true. So you've heard it from the horse's mouth. It was QRP what won it as opposed to anything else. Good on you. Yeah, good on you, Matthew. On this new, on this new story, what's your thoughts on the um, the guidelines? Yeah, well, the guidelines make make total sense. You know, you you, you should uh, they try to facilitate as much home operation as possible. You know, with while still being kind of reasonably close to the multi operator station. So you got to be, you have to be within a, a radius of a hundred kilometers to uh, take part and so forth. I guess my question is, why now? Why have they issued guidelines in, what, October or November when um, we've been in this kind of COVID home uh, lockdown environment for, well, March, April, May time? So it seems, I mean, the RSGB, I know, is issuing guidelines to shape and, and change contest active, uh, participation, you know, months ago. Well, the reason for the, the reason for this is, is, this is this is contest season, right? The you know the lockdown started in late February, March, April, and there weren't any major contests that at that point. Mm-hmm. So now here we we're coming into the major contest season, and that's that's the reason. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Well, let's we'll say I think it was worthwhile the AWRL putting this out. I think it'll give people some uh, guidelines, give them some ideas. It's not mandatory, as we we said earlier. It's uh, it's a good start. Let's be honest about it. And uh, let's say we were looking for some new stories this episode, which we could discuss, and there wasn't much around. But I think that was worth uh, raising, just so people know it's out there. Our last new story, unfortunately, is a little bit sad. But when you look at this guy's life t- lifetime achievements. Yeah, you just have to think he's done really well. The oldest known U.S. radio amateur, Cliff Kahart, W4KKP, unfortunately silent key, and he was 109 when he died. I'll say that again, 109. What an active gentleman. Dan, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, you know, apparently he, he was still quite an active amateur too up till recently. So, you know, that's that's just really something. Uh, I hope, I kind of hope somebody has, you know, gotten his personal history, you know, and, and can so we could capture that. That that would that would to me would be really something. Yeah, looking at looking at what he did. I mean, he was um, got into radio at about the age of nine was in the U.S. Army Signals Corps, uh, worked on radar. Phenomenal gentleman, I, I would suggest. And yeah. uh, probably in the nicest possible way, somebody that kept very quiet, didn't brag about what he did, but very, very, um, had a very, very full life looking at this. Yeah. Matthew, your thoughts? Wow. Well, just wow, I think is, is the, is the thought that comes to mind. First licensed in 1937 and, and not only in, in, 
you know, his exemplary uh, military service, uh, the article goes on to describe his time in the, in the U.S. Army, and Army Signal Corps, in fact, during World War II. But uh, if you look at his professional career, uh, you know, he worked at Magnavox, uh, he worked at RCA, he worked at Philco Radio, Bendix Aviation. These are all names I've even I've heard of, you know. Uh, so, I mean, the, he has been, you know, I get the feeling that he was the kind of one of those people that was in the right place at the right time throughout recent history and he's kind of been at all these kind of milestones it's a nice idea to have perhaps but uh yeah and he was it says he moved into assisted living facility in 2017 which would have put him at an age of 106 uh and he still had an hf station in his room and he was working uh, up until shortly before he died so uh phenomenal as we'd say a good innings from uh cliff and uh I, and i wish i could have met him i think that's probably my my, my final thought yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal, I feel. Edmund, you, any thoughts on this one? Well, I've always believed that what you do in your life is more important than how long your life happens to last. But it seems that this gentleman managed to combine the two. Not only did he live to the ripe old age of 109, but he, as has just been mentioned, was active uh up until the end or pretty much the end so to to get both of those things together is no mean feat in common with practically everybody else in the usa i haven't worked him on the air and uh, i won't get the chance now which is a great pity but uh, a life well lived the uh, the reward for that is to have lived it so uh, condolences to his family and his friends uh, and amateurs who worked him or knew him regularly on the air. And um, I would have liked to have got to meet him as well, uh, Matthew. Uh, back to you, Martin. Yeah, well, the only person that I can think was very similar to him that I met in the UK was your friend Richard Brent Knowles, uh, G3 AATT, or AAT, I think it was, wasn't it, Lizzie? Yes, well, Richard, Richard, Richard was uh, phenomenal with the bits and pieces he was involved in with the convention, and it was uh, really a case of uh, put your put your seatbelt on. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, he's going to make things happen. You know, <laughs> it, it was my. I, I've met people like that in life. I've got somebody I spoke to the other day. She was eighty-five years of age, and uh, she was uh, doing her local church meetings on Zoom. And I just went, good on you. <laughs> what can I say? Just don't, you know, I'm, this is fantastic. But anyway, I digress slightly. It's a, the, the word I was going to use, and it has been used before, that's a really, really good innings. And and it's a life well spent. Cer- certainly is there, you know. it's uh, He's done well, and, yeah, his family should be proud of him. And uh, our condolences, because, Indeed. you know, you, you obviously... You never want to go, but in fairness, it looks like he'd had a very good proactive life. So, uh, uh, shame. Uh, and if I manage to get to 109, God forbid, you lot will have probably had uh, about 700 ICQ podcasts. Hi, hi. But uh, there we go. Right, that concludes our news stories. Let's find out what the guys have been up to. Leslie, what have you been up to in the last month, radio-wise? Getting into trouble, Martin. Getting into <laughs> trouble? Yeah, I know you have. Go on. Oh, no, no. oh well, apart from uh, trying to stay out of trouble, Martin. Well, unfortunately, the local radio club has, has been closed due to the situation at the moment. However, I did do an interview to try and raise awareness on the RF safety issues that Ofcom have done, and I did it with Essex Ham, and that's uh, that's on YouTube. So we've we've raised an awareness on that. I've been pottering about with a spreadsheet so that people can show whether they're they're complying or not. That spreadsheet is publicly available, and I'll be doing the part two with Essex Ham very very shortly, and showing how that spreadsheet works and how they can uh, carry out an assessment. So that's what I've been doing, Martin. Well, that's good news, and that's uh, quite important for the hobby. And uh, we offered uh, you, and I'll talk to Colin about um, pub- publishing 
your, your stuff that you want to make available to people up on the ICQ website. I would appreciate if when they look at it, if, if people sort of think, well, yeah, we like the way you've done that. And any, any additions or something I've missed out, please let me know. Yeah, be positive. Be positive. Positive feedback is good. Bitching mm. is a waste of time. <laughs> Whinging, we call it whinging. <laughs> I'll call it bitching. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's good news, Leslie, good news. Edmund, what have you been up to? Well, before this year, I had never attended the RSGB convention, but in 2020, they held it online and streamed it live, and I watched several of the talks at the time. But within the last week or so, the RSGB have released the lectures, most if not all of them, onto their YouTube channel as separate videos. So you can just click on the one you want and watch it rather than having to locate the lecture of interest somewhere in amongst an eight-hour stream or something like that. So... I've been watching those, or re-watching those, I should say. A couple that I highly recommend. Jim Bacon, G3YLA, gave a talk on uh, amateur radio and weather and how they go together. Uh, there was a really good lecture on uh, an, as an introduction to the Six Metre Band, which is a band that um, I really still should do more with one of these years. And last but not least, um, Kevin and Lauren, G0PEK and 2E0HLR from the Kent Active Radio Amateurs Cara Association. Uh, they gave uh, a wonderful talk, um, including clips of some of their SOTA activations and portable activations. They gave a really good talk um, entitled Adventures in Amateur Radio. So all of the, the talks were good, and uh, I must congratulate the, the RSGB for doing all of that online for the first time ever. But if you were looking through the menu and wondering which individual talks to watch, those three are the ones that I would, would heartily recommend. Apart from that, HF has woken up a bit. We've had uh, quite a big sunspot come on to the, the surface of the sun as part of Solar Cycle 25. That uh, woke up the Solar Flux Index a bit, which meant that there have been quite a lot of um, stations on the upper HF band. 17 metres in particular has been good recently. And this morning there were even, and we're recording this on Wednesday, the, the 4th of November, this morning, there were even weak but copyable VK stations on 15 metres. I didn't try calling them because half of Europe and his dog all had the same idea. So um, getting through on 100 watts and my little wire antenna, I didn't rate my chances, so I didn't even try. But uh, they were definitely there. So it looks like finally propagation on HF might be starting to improve little by little so if you've had your your hf rig switched off for a little while now might be a good time to turn it on again and conditions should be getting better anyway as we move uh, further and further into autumn and leave the summer doldrums behind uh, elsewhere on hf the club call sign golf x-ray 3 whiskey mic uniform gx3 wmu is going back on the air again from Thursday the 5th of November to coincide with the nationwide lockdown in England. Uh, Amberley Museum it has to close its doors to the public once again for this lockdown. So once again, I've uh, offered to put the club call sign on the air from home. So uh, if you're in the UK or Europe, listen out for that one on 40 and 20 metres, probably, mainly, and uh, on VHF, if conditions look like they're, they're going to be any good. Um, and we could well have some nice tropospheric propagation this autumn, including um, on the Sunday that this podcast is released. 
they're supposed to be a nice uh, nice little tropospheric duck ducked over uh, over England on this Sunday so you might hear you might hear that call sign on the air on the, the same day that the podcast is released that will run until the 2nd of December if uh, the club call sign is still on the air on the 3rd of December will will be dictated uh, entirely by what the uh, the government regulations say at that time and last but not least a new d star repeater has gone on the air 3 miles from my house i didn't know it was even on the cards until about 48 hours before it went on air so i thought it would be rude not to have a go at d star wouldn't it so I won a mint condition second-hand uh, ICOM ID51 on a famous auction site and uh, running the super low power setting, 100 milliwatts, I can get into the repeater GB7CQ using just a little HB9CV uh, antenna, which is up in my attic, sellotaped to the rafters. No, actually, it's a bit of string rather than sellotape, but um, no expense spared and all that. So uh, if you are very unlucky, you might well come across me on D-Star. I've, um, I've done the deed, Martin. How about that? Well, there's nothing wrong with D-Star, apart from my, uh, my radio was a Friday radio. I'm sure it was just unreliable from day one. Um, it went back to the manufacturer umpteen times and... Uh, you just accept that in the end, give up. But uh, my Ruffle does quite a lot on D Star, which is good. I'm going to leave Matt to the end, Matt, because you've probably done a hell of a lot, and go to Dan first. Dan, what have you been up to in the last four weeks? Well, you know, we've been talking about uh, doing satellites here for I don't know how long, right? I finally made my first satellite contact. And it, it's amazing. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. I, I bought a uh, bought a arrow, uh, one of those arrow double Yagi antennas, and uh, uh, I was just using. A, I, I have this radio. It's like a Baofeng, but it's they they claim it's better than a Baofeng. It's from this company here in the U.S. called B Tech. But uh, you know, just a regular HT and this uh, this double Yagi, and uh, I, I was lucky enough to uh, uh, work somebody through the satellites. So that was pretty cool, and then and so. Then I came to come to find out that I really should be using uh, a duplex setup, right? So some guys uh, are actually using two HTs at a time. Uh, I decided to pop for a, a fancier radio. I bought a uh, Kenwood THD72A, and that just came a couple of days ago. So I'm still learning how to how to use that, how to set it up for duplex. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing satellites. Well, congratulations, Dan first of all and that model of kenwood is one of the few genuinely full duplex handhelds that are still available today so i just wondered which satellite did you use was it ao91 or did you go through the international space station no it was actually a p0101 the dewada 2b oh nice congratulations yeah so that was that was pretty cool yeah, it sounds like you've enjoyed yourself, Dan. It sounds like you're having fun. Yeah, you know, it's. I mean, it, I mean, really, it's kind of amazing. You, I mean, you look kind of stupid standing out in the front yard, pointing this thing up at the sky, waving it around. But uh, you know, like you know, you point it in the direction you think it's supposed to come from, from you know the the satellite spotters, and you know, you hear signals. You know, it's like <laughs> it's it's just. Uh, you know, kind of brings some of the fun back into ham radio, right? Sounds like the magic of radio, eh? Yeah, yeah, really. So, so you're the new, you're the new into satellites, then, Dan. So, 2021 is going to be a satellite year for you. Yeah, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to start uh, working all those grid squares. Well, it's something new. It's something new, so it'll be good. It'll be good. Matthew, you've been away for eight months. I know you've built a couple of kits because you told me the other day when we spoke on the phone, but uh, how's life been treating you? Uh, well, um, life is okay. Life is okay. Thanks. Um, uh, in I guess if I should go back to March when uh, the first wave kind of came over Europe and um, I made a very quick decision to leave the UK on a Monday night 
and, and arrived, well, on the Tuesday, I got my flight and, and, and arrived here in Spain for the lockdown. And of course, I didn't pack any radios. I just kind of came. And so for the next six months, I was in Spain until early September and, you know, twiddling my thumbs, trying to think how I'd keep my, my hobby alive. Uh, I built myself a, um, a small paddle, you know, out of a, a classic hacksaw blade and, and a couple of bolts and, and, and fixtures from the hardware store bolted down to a heavy piece of wood and then reached out for, uh, ordered an Arduino kit online and built, you know, a buzzer and uh, a decoder so that um, I could practice tapping out and, and uh, uh, you know, trying to, trying to learn the craft, as, as Dan would say, I'm sure, uh, to, to practice CW and uh, had it set up so I could type on my computer using Morse code so it would kind of read the, uh, read the decoded signals like a keyboard and so you could, you could type away. Uh, and that that was fun. That kept me busy. I learned a bit of coding, a little bit of this, and, and a bit of CW. I bought myself a shortwave radio from Amazon just so I could listen to the bands while I was here. One of these Texan uh, PL880, I think it was. Or no, it was a PL660, I think, was the, the model I, I opt, opted for. Uh, and that that was good fun. A little bit of shortwave listening took me back to when I was about 15 and doing SWL uh, activities. And uh, while I was there, I just discovered that uh, QRP Labs, uh, Hans Summers' um, company, uh, had released a new kit for their QCX range. They have a, I had I had built a QCX uh, a CW uh, transceiver, a little five watt transceiver, uh, last year for 40 meters, and I thought, oh, he's got a new kit. What does it look like? The QCX Plus is essentially the same radio design. Uh, but it's in a slightly larger board. It's a little easier to construct, perhaps a bit more space. Uh, and uh, it comes in a fantastic case. You can get this optional case to go with it. It's really a beautiful kit. And I have to say, having spent my own personal money, that um, QRP Lab kits are are fantastic. They're well documented, extremely well documented. Construction you know, information is there. Parts are, are high quality. The boards are beautiful. Big, I'm a big fan. So thank you, Hans, uh, for, for making that happen. Anyway, so I ordered a CQX Plus kit with the intention of building a 30-meter version because I think I have enough uh, antenna space out in the back patio here. I live, we live in a con- kind of a patio uh, apartment complex, low-rise low, low, uh, low apartments. Uh, I could probably get a 30-meter dipole up. So I ordered the CQX Plus. I ordered the, the, the 50-watt amplifier, the PA amplifier that they have. Uh, and a few bits and pieces, dummy load, and I was going to build it here in Spain and then get to use it. But as it seems, uh, I, I think I was a, a, perhaps a victim of QRP's success, a QRP lab success, because this Duke kit sold out quite quickly and he ran out of parts. Uh, and um, so long story short, I got my, my kit uh, towards the end of August. And then by September, I was flying back to the UK. So I, did, I didn't have a chance to use it here in Spain. But during that month in, uh, that I was in, in London, September to October, uh, I put out the, 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 the CQX Plus kit together, a 30-meter kit. I put together the PA amplifier, uh, the dummy load. Um, I had built a small RF power meter a couple of years ago, uh, which uses ver- which only measures very, very low power, you know, like uh, minus 70 dBm, minus 50 dBm. Those are micro, you know, nanowatt levels. And uh, so I built myself an RF sampler, a little tap, a 50 dB tap, so that I could test these radios that I was building for their power output uh, and measure it with this very low power RF gear that I had. So I had a, a period of a, of a month uh, back in London where I was building every night and testing and trying to get the oscilloscope to work and connect it up. And I was having a great time. Uh, and so now I'm back here in, uh, in Spain, in the EA5 region, so sort of southeastern Spain and uh, have brought some radio gear. Looking forward to uh, getting getting on the air. And, and as Dan says, get on the air and just do the CW stuff and practice as much on, with uh, w- you know suffering other hams rather than just uh, with the, uh, the trainer on my laptop. But uh, just the other day, I actually put up a pole and tuned 30 meter dipole and it came in at uh, and a 1.2 to 1 so I figure something's working otherwise it's a perfect dummy load and I don't know <laughs> we'll see if anyone can hear me uh, in the next couple of days but uh, I had to take it down the, yesterday because we're expecting thunderstorms coming through the region in the next couple of days so yeah uh, I'm here probably for a few more months uh, over Christmas uh, anticipating lockdown as it, as it may or may not transpire but I will have radio 
Uh, you might even work me on uh, on CW on 30 meters and, and um, possibly 40 meters, and I will be Echo Alpha 5 Stroke Mike Zero November Juliet X-Ray. So that's my that's my activity. Back to you. Hey, uh, you know, you might want to check out my uh, website. I just posted a, a video of a guy who made his first CW contact on the air, and it's a, it's a very cute video. He's you can tell how nervous he is and all that, but you might want to check it out because it's really cute. I will look at it. I will look at it. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like you've been doing a lot, Matthew. So uh, and, uh, we're glad to have you back with us on, on the podcast. For myself, well, I feel a bit of a fraud now because uh, I've not very done very much radio. The usual FM stuff from the car, uh, 2 meters 70 sems, uh, I'm traveling to and from work. For anybody who's heard sort of bangs and flutters in the background of this recording, it's because in the UK... We're fairly close to Guy Fawkes Night, where they celebrate uh, an act of treason, blowing up the House of Parliament or not blowing it up. But so there's fireworks been going off all over the show. And the other things I've been doing, really, well, I've been playing with my SDR play and my BHI speaker. And the more I look at those two pieces of kit, I think how good they are. The uh, SDR plays a great software defined receiver, and the uh, noise limiting speaker from BHI certainly does get the approval of Mrs. B. Um, but I don't get any grief when I'm listening because you don't hear all the horrible noise in the background all the time. So that's a good one. Have been building a few bits and pieces, and I'll cover that more when I've got completion on a few items, but I'll let you know more what's going on there. Uh, last but not least, I want to say get well to Steve Thomas, the RSGB uh, general manager. Steve's call sign M1ACB. Uh, Steve has not been very well recently, but um, was booked to do an interview with us this month. Uh, we'll probably do it in December. So uh, get well soon, Steve. Yeah, get well soon. Yeah, get well soon. That's that's from all of us, from the whole team, Steve. Right. So uh, that concludes what we've been up to. Well, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining me tonight. Uh, it's been a bit, uh, the Gremlins have hit us a little bit hard a couple of times, <laughs> but at least we've got through it. I'd like to thank Mr. Leslie Busfield, G0CIB. Okay, Martin, thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Yeah, yeah. And like you, we're both on shift work and we're both up at stupid o'clock tomorrow oh, morning. Oh, it's, it's a crazy world we live in. Yeah, it certainly is, mate. I'd like to thank Mr. Dan Romatic, KB6NU. Glad to be here. Yeah, you, you, yours is a more civilized time of the day to be doing this, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's only uh, 4.15 here. Yeah, yeah, but uh, thanks thanks for joining us, Dan. Also, I'd like to thank Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MMG. Good to have you, Edmund. Thanks for having me on, Martin. Yeah, it's great, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. And last but not least, Mr. Matthew Nassau, M zero njx uh, thanks for joining us matt oh my pleasure it's it's just it's great to be back and to remind myself how much fun this is so thank you yeah yeah well you you as I say we have we always have fun and uh, it's uh, glad to have you back with us bring some interesting comments to the table right i'm going to say 73 to you guys and then uh, we'll continue with the rest of the podcast 73 guys cheerio 73. Seven three. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links, and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. Well, now it's time to have a look at the news in brief with me, Colin M6BOY. Hard to believe, but 10 years ago uh, this November, 33 miners were rescued in San Jose mine in uh, Chile. To mark uh, this anniversary, uh, a special re uh, event call sign is available, XR33M, uh, I say to mark this, uh, this uh, wonderful rescue of the miners. Operations will be from 80 down to 6 metres using uh, CW, single sideband, SSTV, FT4 and FT8, PSK and RITI. Stations that make contact 
with uh, XR33M will receive a special commemorative QSL via the Bureau once the activity is complete. Uh, so as I say, certainly check that one out. And uh, it's amazing to think that that rescue was 10 years ago uh, this week, this month, uh, this week and such. So uh, on the 13th of November. So uh, certainly look out for that special event call sign. Now, as, uh, unfortunately, parts of the world, particularly in Europe, head into another lockdown. Uh, it's probably good to get uh, some reading material lined up. And we have to thank uh, Yidian Yurusul, uh, Yankee Oscar 3, Delta Alpha Charlie. And he's made uh, some PDFs of radio books from the 1920s, 30s and 40s available. And these include uh, the Wireless Experimenter's Manual, Radio, Miracle the 20th Century, Principles of Radio, automatic frequency control systems and the df handbook for wireless operators uh, so we're going to pop a uh, link on the uh, icq podcast webpage where you can potentially download these books and certainly something to uh, help the dark nights as uh, i say we're looking at the uh, the problems obviously of being here in a european lockdown uh, because of the c word now talking about uh, potential things to do we've got some good news here in uh, the uk uh, RAF uh, Stenengolt's uh, site in the Lincolnshire Wolds um, has uh, got its uh, repeaters uh, reinstated. So the repeaters are uh, Mike Bravo 7 Papa Alpha. It's a 6 meter parrot repeater. Uh, GB3 Lima Charlie, which is a 70 cents analog repeater. And GB7 Juliet Mike, uh, which is a repeater which is looking we're, we're to be used with uh, DMR and uh, D-Star. So great news that these, uh, um, I say, these repeaters are coming back online uh, in the UK. Uh, as I say, so certainly uh, welcome. Let the guys know uh, what you think. Uh, and I say it'd be great for them to get the feedback accordingly. Um, there's been some hams as well that have uh, done some uh, lovely stuff in donating time and effort along the way, including uh, Brian G7 Alpha Juliet Papa, Tony 2E0 Oscar Zulu Quebec, uh, and uh, Alan Mike Zero Alpha Quebec charlie uh so uh say thank you very much guys for donating into our hobby and it's great to get those repeaters back on the air right well now we're going to head over to our feature this episode where we're going to be announcing the homebrew hero for 2020 hope you enjoy and now what you've all been waiting for this episode's feature from the icq podcast Well, hi guys. This year's come around yet again. I'm about to announce this year's homebrew hero for 2020. And it's been a great year for Hans Summers in 2019. But this year, we have Mr. George Thomas, W5JDX. Hi, George. Oh, hi, Martin. Let me say what an honor it is to to be here with you today. And... Uh, and thanks so much for the recognition and the award there. I was not expecting this at all. It just came out of the blue. Well, for, well, George, in fairness, I don't get to choose uh, because Frank won't let me on the, uh, on, on the steering committee that does the choosing. But uh, in fairness, in fairness, they always seem to do a very, very good job. And uh, as I say, you've been very very active in your amateur career i know that uh, most people will know you from um, amateur logic tv which uh, you've been doing for over 15 years you also do uh, ham college tv and dare i say it you help out on ham nation which is uh, also began must be 10 years ham nation isn't it I think we're right around 10 years. Yeah, it's uh, it's been going a while, and it has really been a privilege to to work with Bob Heil and Gordon West and everyone else on that show. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, it's great. You, I mean, you're weekly on the Ham Nation. We're fortnightly. But uh, so most people who know you from that, George, but I know you've done a lot in your life, but as well you've you're a broadcast engineer you're a software developer podcast producer like ourselves um but tell us tell us what got you into the hobby in the first place george well actually i i grew up in a very small town and there were no hams 
anywhere around there. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it was a small uh, junior college town. Uh, during the, the year when school was going, we, my population was maybe like a thousand. When school was out, it dropped to about 500. So I didn't know anybody else who knew anything about radio that experimented with electronics or anything like that. And, but they were just my interest for some reason. And I bought the popular electronics magazines and went through them as a kid and looked at the things they had in there and uh, just kind of experimented with basic stuff like switches and speakers and, you know, tying things together. And I ran across an article one time in one of those magazines about building a transmitter that you could connect to a fence and talk for a number of miles. And it required a ham radio license. That may have been the first time I'd heard of amateur radio. And I, I was interested but I just didn't know anybody else who was doing it. Uh, so I really didn't have any Elmers. And I eventually bought a copy of the ARRL handbook. I don't remember what year that was. Probably, I don't know, sometime in the 70s. But I had a general interest in radio. And in 72, while I was still in high school, I got a job at a, a radio station a couple of towns over. And we had to take our third class uh, radio telephone license exam. It basically rules and regulations, that type of thing. And I didn't really want to be a disc jockey so much as I wanted to do the technical stuff. But, you know, being a disc jockey was about the only job they had for a 16-year-old, so I took it. And so... Yeah. I. I did that for about five years and while I was going to school and and got out and I never this was this was seventy two I got licensed with a commercial ticket. I did not become a ham until nineteen ninety one when finally someone mentioned to me, uh well a good friend of mine, Jim N five SPE, who we started amateur logic with. Yeah. Uh he said they, they've just dropped the Morse code requirement for the technician exam, and I'm coming down there this weekend, and we're going to go take our test. And I said, okay, and it's, it's been quite a fun trip ever since. I've been active the whole time since 91, and I wish I would have done it years ago. I just I didn't know anybody doing it. A friend of mine one point gave me a Smith Code Course record. He couldn't right. find the book that went with it, so I didn't learn the code. And that's, that's pretty what, much what kept me out, because the electronics and all I really had a big interest in and have played with, you know, most of my life. So Yeah. But that's kind of where I got into ham radio. I'd already worked in radio and television for a number of years. And still, there was more to learn. I had a couple of great Elmers uh, in, uh, well, in broadcasting. But when I got to ham radio, I met these other guys that knew a lot about it. And they were very helpful in getting me started because, you know, there's some things that hams do that um, the commercial broadcasters really don't do you know in, in ham radio we're building so much stuff and and trying to do things as cheaply as we can that these tips from these um, guys who have been hams for a while were really a big help to me so certainly is uh, i spent um didn't quite go the same route as you i probably should have been licensed around about 76 uh went to night school to do this the, uh, the the instructor wasn't particularly interested, and I lost interest. And it wasn't till around about ninety nine that uh, I was um, sitting doing a contract job, and one of the other contractors said, "Oh, you need a hobby." I went, "Oh yeah." He said, uh, 
how about ham radio? I said, oh, yeah, I, but I'm not all that. And he went, I oh, would sit down and I'd done, um, I'd been a radio and TV engineer earlier on. And we actually just did the, uh, sat there for the, for lunchtime. And he said at the end of it, he said, oh, why don't you just take the test? He said, you only need to learn the, the um, you only need to learn the regulations. But I went away and I actually uh, enjoyed it myself. And I, I think one of the biggest things I've got from amateur radio, and hopefully you have as well, is the comradeship. The, yes. The, 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 there seem to be genuine people in amateur radio. You know, we work together, we help each other. And there's a lot of good vibes, I would suggest. Yeah, the the radio station I worked for, the owner of that station, actually was a ham. And he had told me I, I need to look into it, but I, I didn't. You know, I was a teenager, and I was working at night at the radio station. I played drums, too, and did a little of that. And then, you know, you had to chase girls a little bit. I just didn't leave any time to sit down and hit the books for ham radio. But yeah. he he had told me doesn't matter where you go in the world if if you're a ham you're going to have a friend there and that's true, true. right true mm -hmm. right and i think we all we all, we all find discover girls and that puts a, a large part of our life life on hold for a while but i've said to lots of people and and the youngsters it doesn't matter once you've got your license you're in the hobby for life as long as you you know just renew it you might not actually do anything for a while, but you're in. Uh, so yeah. um, that's good. And then I suppose in the broadcast industry and uh, a lot of things you do now in your pro life are all about building things, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they are. You know, and typically in the broadcast industry, you're maintaining equipment that was commercially purchased. But there are some things you need that, are just not available. You've got a specific situation you're trying to solve, and sometimes you have to build this device or whatever you need on your own so you can customize it and and make it do what's needed there. Now, that's not done as much these days as it was back in um, the earlier days in broadcasting because there's yeah. so many products out there, and the, I don't think the knowledge runs as deep today with the people who are coming into that but you know back earlier they had to do all that stuff because the gear didn't exist and i i really enjoy that a lot i've done it most of my life now a lot of what i do is not necessarily building something from scratch as much as it is taking one or more things that are already built assembling them together making some modifications to where it works the way that that i want it to and i i have as much fun doing that as i do building stuff yeah well that's systems that's system building isn't it so instead of building a small device you're building systems which is equally uh, a skill and it's, you know you, you you end up with a product as you say that does what you require it to do it is and one of my favorite things for the last few years here, it's not the only thing I do, but I, a lot of it, these little microcontrollers have gotten so inexpensive. You know, it's basically just a chip, and it's a whole computer on a chip, and um, you program it to do the task you want. You, you've got TTL inputs and outputs on it, so you can connect it to other stuff. I have thoroughly enjoyed playing with the Arduinos. Uh, I played with the basic stamps when they came out. I play with the Raspberry Pis some too. I probably kind of lean in the direction of the Arduinos. And I try to encourage people all the time, you really need to take a look at that because you can build these complex systems with, you know, this little $5 chip. Or you can already buy it assembled on a board for, you know, $30 or less. Um, some of them as low as, you know, 5 or $10. And things that you would have set down and drawn out the PC board for and added all these discrete components, 
you can build in this little microcontroller uh, with just a little bit of code and you don't have to buy all those parts and assemble them you just program the device to do it and programming is not as hard as you would think you know in so many cases what you want to done or excuse me what you want to do someone has already done or something similar to it and they share the code you can just go download it upload it to the device and it works after you've done that a few times and analyze the code maybe looked up some terms on the internet you can kind of understand what it is and you might go in and just make a few changes on it and customize it for your exact use and it's uh, it took a lot less physical building probably cost less than you would have spent on discrete components and you've learned a little more about that type of thing. So that's one of my big fun things to do. I'm self-taught as a programmer and uh, I actually own um, uh, part of a software company that makes automation systems for radio stations. Uh, Tommy N5ZNO, my partner on Amateur Logic, yeah. and another ham, one of my Elmers I was telling you about, Bob, uh, who was N5RMZ, he, he let his license lapse, so he's not uh, a ham now. But we started a company and wrote the software and started the, a company to do that. And, you know, I did that for almost 20 years exclusively. Yeah. And, and then I just got back into doing radio engineering here in the last uh, four or five years. I had laid that to the side. I, I had gotten enough of it, but finally, uh, um, well, a group of stations here in town needed an engineer, and they couldn't find one. They made me an attractive offer, and I had been out of it so long that I was no longer burnt out. I was ready to get back into it. That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, I, I, I almost got into broadcast engineering once myself, uh, radio station in london uh didn't quite get the job but i got down to the last few and i hadn't i was going against people who had experience but what do you say about to arduinos i've certainly played with the arduinos and got a few little projects on the go and the, the they're very they're, they're aiming us in the right direction because we are moving far more into a software defined radio world and uh, where you're going to have to program things and the arduino is just such a, a nice device to learn and as you say there are varying in prices depending on where you buy them from but because the hardware is open source there are no pirate copies of an arduino right because yeah. they're they're pirates, they're open source anybody can manufacture them so you can sometimes buy them for absolutely stupid money and you don't you, you don't even have to buy a power supply you can plug it into um you know a usb label plug it in and once you've written your code there's no operating system you know you, you just plug it in and it does what it says on the tin or what your program this wants you to do so I agree, George. I've got one or two little devices I'm quite pleased with that work very well. And I'm not the best programmer in the world, but uh, that's, I think, the way we're going rather than, you know, sitting there soldering lots of components together. Yeah, you know, and I feel fortunate to have had that experience of soldering the components together and, and working at that level because that's all we did, you know, before uh, these type of things came along. And so... You can tie those two together. You can use the Arduino and tie your discrete components to build a very complex system. But so much of it, you can just have in that one little chip. And yeah. as you say, you just uh, upload the code into it or download it, whichever way you want to call it. And it's, it's not really an operating system, so it's not going to crash like your Windows PC. It's just going yeah. to run, purpose-built, and that's all it knows is what you told it to do. So very, very robust. 
Yeah, and if it does crash, it's your own fault because you wrote the program. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, so, but no, no, all jesting aside. So now you've got a year where you're going to be our homebrew hero uh, for the for the next year. Have you got anything planned? Does, has this sparked any interest for you? Well, it's, uh, and by the way, I'll just show this. I know Frank would like me to uh -huh. show this, and uh, if I can get it. Yeah, yeah. It's not glared too much this is my homebrew oh, hero plaque i'll be displaying and and polishing off and uh trying to live up to it i you know as far as what i'm gonna build i don't start out with too many concrete ideas they just hit me as they come along and i might be surfing the web and and run across something and that sparks an idea or I might run across a problem that I need to solve, and that sparks an idea. Currently, and I meant to have it back here, but I, I don't. It's on the uh, other side of the office here. I've been working with a little ESP8266 module. It's uh, You program it with the Arduino language, and it's a little microcontroller. It's not the same one that they use in the Arduino, but yeah. they have written the drivers and all for it, so it just works like, you know, uh, the operating or, or the uh, programming environment doesn't really know that it's not an Arduino. They use basically the same commands. A few things are slightly different. It's just a little tiny module that has Wi-Fi built in it, and you can buy these things for under $10 a piece. So I've got one of those. And I've been working with it, and I bought a uh, an eight relay interface board. It's just a you know cheap uh, Chinese board that has eight single pole double throw relays on it. It's about yeah. Oh, you know maybe that big. That itself was probably around ten bucks, and so I've connected them together, and uh, I can take my phone or a web browser or whatever. And I can log in to that little module, and it will send me back a web page with an interface with the eight relays, and I can turn on or off things remotely using my phone or whatever. And here I've done this for less than 20 bucks. And to have something that gives you that kind of control, say, five or ten years ago, would have cost a substantial amount more. I mean, to do stuff like that at the broadcast stations, remote controls, you know, we'd pay a thousand dollars or more for something that does basically what I've done here for twenty dollars. Here's the completed project. Well, almost completed. It's down to the software now, and it's I, I just keep adding things to it. But there's the eight channel relay board right there. You know, that cost ten bucks. Just uh. You know, you can find those all over the internet. Here yeah. is the ESP8266, the little microcontroller yeah. with the, the Wi-Fi built on it. You can see that little silver can right there. That's the Wi-Fi yeah. device. Yeah. There's the antenna. It's mounted crooked because, well, where the mounting holes were, that's the only way I could get it. And I've got a piece of uh, ribbon here, uh, multicolored ribbon cable. Yeah, I like to yeah. use that because then you can, it's much easier to trace through and make sure you've got things going in the right position. But that's oh, yes. all, all there is to it, and it's complete. I put me a power jack on it here uh, so I yeah. can you know run in voltage. And uh, The thing is working. I'm just still tweaking on the code a little bit, and I'm going to make that code available as, as soon as I'm ready to publish it. Uh, hopefully it won't be very long because I've been working on this for several months now. I just keep adding things to it. But uh, you'll be able to download the code and do your own A-channel relay board there, Wi-Fi controlled. You'll need to change the, the password, of course, and the SSID for your network. A couple True. of little yeah. things like that, but those are going to be pretty simple to do. And I'm going to make that as simple as possible. Or you may want to go in and change something else about it. So uh, it'll be out there. It could be used as is with just entering your credentials. Or 
take it apart and do whatever you want to with it. That's most of the, the things like this I do. I, I share the source code and uh, because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the, the things I build is source code I downloaded yeah. from someone else that they put in the public domain and just modify it around. No reason to reinvent the wheel. So very true, very true. But from what you're saying, for around about $20, you've almost got a home automation system there. Uh, but even better than that, how about a shack automation system? You know, being able to switch the rig on before you get in the shack and the lights and the bits and pieces. So uh, as you're making your way to the shack, you're setting everything up. And Increase your operator. That's one thing yeah. I, I have in mind for this. You know, in, MFJ makes a uh, an eight-port antenna switch. It, it's got yeah. eight PL259s, or actually SO239s for your antennas, and then, um, you know, one common one to connect your rig to. I And they have a control box with push buttons on it, and I think maybe you can control it uh, with a serial port. I want to just just get the relay part of that connected up with this, and then I've got a Wi-Fi controlled antenna switch. So uh, that would be perfect for when you're remoting into your rig, and you need to change antennas. Well, you just do it over Wi-Fi right there, and then uh, that's always kind of seemed to be a limiting factor to me on remoting. Is uh, okay, you connect to the rig, and you can control it over the internet and get your audio back and forth. But what about switching antennas? And this just seems like um, a project waiting to happen. It certainly does, because, uh, yeah, all right, some rigs you can have two antennas, but uh, if you've got eight antennas sw switch, that gives you a lot more, lot more uh, flexibility. And uh, as I said, I think uh, this is the way things are going. Software-defined radios now seem to be the way everybody's going. And software control. We need to be able to do these things in software. And, you know, as you've said, one of those little boards uh, can do a hell of a lot more than discrete components. If you did it in discrete components, you'd have a massive uh, thing about probably 10 times the size of that to do what that little board does. Oh, yeah. If, if not larger than that. And, you know, you're going to have to burn a PC board, and once you've done that and got all your components soldered down, if you want to make a change to it, hmm, that could be difficult. But with these, you know, you just go in and change a couple of lines or parameters in some of the source code and upload it again, and and you're ready to go there. So, yeah, I'll, I'll agree. I think this is the way things are shifting, but... Working with discrete components is still fun, and I just did, well, in the last episode of Amateur Logic, I pulled out some old 22, or excuse me, 2 n 22 22 transistors and just did three little projects with those and just a few components on the show just to show that, hey, you can do this stuff too, and, you know, here's some, some uh, basic circuits you can build, thanks to Forrest Mims and his engineers many notebooks i've always been a big believer in the forest mems books so yeah you know it's it's there why not use it yeah well i think that that's the fun fun of what we do amateur amateur radio the building side of it is one part of it and uh, as i say obviously you enjoy that that side i must admit i do as well and but it's the way things are going. And now, if somebody wants to be a, an appliance operator, they still can in this hobby. But I don't know. This hobby's big enough for us to all enjoy it, I would say. Yeah, you're exactly right. There are so many different facets to the hobby. Some people like to contest. I, I don't really do much contesting. I'll do field day. Um you know, some people like to just get on and rag chew. Some people like to do CW or digital modes. Uh, some people like to build. I like a little bit of all those things, but not a whole lot of anyone in particular, except the building and experimenting. I really like that. And I'll, like Phil Day, 
we'll go out and uh, and do field day out in the woods here. Uh, you know, a couple of our, our friends here, Tommy, my partner on Amateur Logic, and uh, our good friend Wayne, KG5RE. Just about every year, we didn't this year now, and we haven't when it's rained out, but we'll go out in the woods, pitch a tent, and completely off the grid, set up our antennas, and and do field day for the weekend. And we spend more time setting all that up and adjusting it and trying it out than we actually do making contacts. And it's still just a lot of fun. That's what it's all about. If it isn't fun, we wouldn't do it. Uh, as I say, I do go out uh, with the club contesting uh, for our SSB field day. But uh, outside of that, I really don't do that many contests. Occasionally, I'll give a few points away, but uh, as I say, I'm not a contester uh, per se. But um, going uh, forward, George, I think it would be nice to uh, get you back onto the ICQ podcast in the near future. So once you've uh, settled in as the homebrew hero of 2020, you're going to hold that title around till late 21. So, uh, you know, it, it's nice. You've got your nice plaque, nice shirts, mm -hmm. and uh, be nice to see what you've been up to later on because uh, that'll, be, that'll be a good one, George, I would suggest. Well, yeah, and I would like to join you all and catch up on things. And as well, I'd, I'd like to have you join us on Amateur Logic or Ham Nation sometime soon. I got to tell you, uh, those are mighty big shoes to fill there uh, to wear this shirt right here and follow behind Hans is going to be a tough act to follow. But I'm going to do my best. It'll probably be a little different flavor uh, because just whatever I'm doing is is whatever we'll show and uh, and share with people. And, you know, next year, next uh, Homebrew Hero may have a completely different take on it as well. So we'll just have to see. I don't have any concrete plans, but that's never stopped me before. Well, that's fine. And uh, as I say, um next year's homebrew hero whoever they are and i say they because it could be a lady next year for all i know uh, i'm not actually on the steering committee that uh, her chooses but uh, i enjoy actually doing the announcement frank lets me do the announcement which is good but uh, i say that's all good now george if somebody would like to talk get hold of you to talk to you what's the best way of contacting you well, email. I don't hide my email address, and it's pretty easy to figure out. I'm George at AmateurLogic.tv. So uh, just drop me an email if you got a question. Or if you'd like to share one of your projects with me, you know, let me know what you're building. Send me some photos. I'm always real interested to see what other people are doing because there's a lot of stuff going on out there that we don't hear about and always great. Uh, you know, kind of get a feel for for what other people have got going on. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm sure that your colleagues on Amateur Logic and Tam Nation are going to rib you about being a homebrew hero. I think they're going to be somewhat jealous. I know they won't mean it nastily. I, I would say that uh, they're going to be pleased for you, but are you expecting a little bit of ribbing? I'm expecting a fair amount of ribbing. I'll have to be honest, Martin. Um, yeah, you know, a couple of our guys like to do photoshopping of photos. So I expect to to see some pictures of me wearing a cape or, or no telling what. Uh, they usually uh, surprise me with those type of things. And so you'll never see it coming until it's there. But, yeah, I, I suspect there'll be a little ribbon involved, but uh, that's okay. And I, I do want to say that I couldn't do the things I do without the support of, you know, all the other people who do it, too. It's, you know, we're all just out there trying to have a good time and share what we're doing, you know, get more people interested. 
that's what it's about that's what it's about uh as i say like yourself we uh, we do it for the enjoyment of the hobby and uh, one day if i can find it i'll send you the uh, rules that colin published once for icq presenters and it's something like uh, it mentions the number of coffees i have <laughs> and i'm not allowed to be a let loose on my own because i commit to things <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Uh, if I can find it, I'll send you. It's quite a giggle. It's all done tongue in cheek, but uh, yeah, you have to. I mean, if you if you give it, if you enjoy in the banter, you give the banter. You have to be able to take it. And uh, I think as long as it's done in good faith, nobody minds. But uh, there you go. So, George, any last things you'd like to tell us before we wind this up? Um, you know, the biggest thing I like to tell people is. To, to get started, you know, the, the project that is most likely to be successfully completed is the one that you actually started. If you're sitting over there with a box full of parts and ideas, but you never do anything, you'll never finish it. So I like to tell people, get out there and get your hands dirty. Do a little bit of soldering. Maybe you don't solder so well. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And just just get started experimenting, you know. That's a big part of the hobby for me. I know it's not everybody's thing, but, you know, if you've got any interest at all, you you should be trying some things. It's never too late to get started with that. And, again, thanks for this award. It's uh, it's going to be tough to to wear the cape and, and keep up with it. But, uh, you know, I'm going to do my best this year. And... Like I say, no concrete ideas on projects I'm going to do yet, but that's not the way I work. They'll just come about, and uh, when it strikes the fancy, we'll put it out there. and We'll look at the end of the year and see what we came up with. That'll be good. Well, we'll catch up with you throughout the year, and uh, let's say that all sounds good. Well, I'd like to thank you uh, very much, George, for giving us your time. And it's been my pleasure to make the announcement of on the Homebrew Heroes. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'll say 73. All right. Thank you, Martin, and everyone affiliated with Homebrew Heroes and the ICQ podcast. 73. 73, George. The ICQ podcast. Come for a moment. Stay for an hour. Well, congratulations, George Thomas, for being the 2020 Homebrew Hero and uh, certainly a, a worthy winner of the award. And congratulations to everybody involved in the background for uh, pulling together uh, the award for the second year running. So uh, congratulations there, George. And uh, Dad, I'm sure it's uh, an interview you uh, you very much enjoyed. And uh, George is a good bloke. Yeah, I uh, was I was realising it was a shame we didn't meet George when we were in... Um dayton last year but he was there but it was uh, such a big place and i po apologized to him we didn't meet him but uh, nice gentleman i had a great chat with him and uh, hopefully we'll be having more chats as the years go on so uh, good one got him yeah so 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 okay feedback time and uh so we've got a first piece of feedback from uh, michel leblanc um ve9 golf in the sierra and it's in relation to episode uh 336 our last episode and he's uh, commenting in relation to space junk. And he says he wonders how much space junk uh, would be magnetic. Could high power magnets like neodymium magnets be useful to trap a portion of the space junk? And I know not take uh, most, but maybe 40% and it might help to clear up some of the space junk. In relation to cube satellites, uh, his thoughts are that the high power rocketry uh, and the hobby of high power rocketry could be employed to nudge a lightweight CubeSat out of place uh, on its orbit and knock it towards Earth. Um, he says, I'm certified to use up to L motors or a or 5120 for a 1520 Newton of thrust. And he says the uh, motors uh, with fuel and oxidizer, it should ignite in space or in the orbit. Uh, so it certainly sounds like uh, Mish is uh, quite a, a big into that uh, rocketry part of the world. 
He's also put us in direction of a Canadian uh, rocket motor manufacturer, uh, Cesaro Technology Incorporated. Uh, so it's up there. And he says, in relation to the tin for hat uh, division, I have no fear about the metals burning up as most of our complex metals come from uh, space debris anyway. Uh, my fear is durable uh, insulated tanks of products like the very uh, toxic hydronized uh, fuel. Uh, so that's uh, Misha's thoughts in relation to the conversation last episode in relation to uh, space junk and uh, the satellites that are above us. Carrying on for that, Terry Bradford, uh, M7, uh, India Sierra Sierra. Great call sign for this one, uh, Terry. Um, says that uh, he's thinking about the recent podcast talking about satellites and their ability to orbit with a payload so they can be sent back to Earth at the end of their usable life. Frankly, says it's scary to think that we could find ourselves underneath an orbit of satellites which have the ability to, to adjust their orbit and could be hacked or simply become defective and propel themselves towards their uh, other objects in either space or obviously down towards Earth. He said if he had the money to send up a satellite, he'd prefer it to set it on a course with uh, no ability to alter this and once it passes its end of useful life, can be tracked and known its whereabouts. I need to keep up the work on the show. That's on Terry M7, India CSEO. So that's certainly um, two very interesting conflicting uh, views in relation to uh, satellites uh, following on from our uh, episode uh, two weeks ago. And uh, certainly some, some good points from bo- both sides of, uh, of the coin there, isn't there? Yeah, it certainly is, Colin. And in fairness, uh, you know, there is always going to be two points of view or more than two points of view. So I'm glad the guys wrote in. I think at some point in time, we we're already worrying about uh, cleaning up the planet, the, the earth here. Uh, we ought to consider cleaning up whatever we throw, throw away. And if a satellite end of use life is a throwaway item, which it appears it will be, at some point in time, we're going to have to deal with that. But it sounds uh, I'm going all green. And read a tin hat foil brigade. Um, Les is probably the most tin hat foil person I know at the moment. Uh, but uh, we do understand, and some of the comments are made a little bit tongue-in-cheek. But uh, in fairness, uh, I think we are heading towards a, a problem in future years. Yeah, I, I, I suppose there's, there's an element, isn't there, between being a, a responsible... I don't. I would use the word scientist loosely in one respect, but cer- certainly a, a responsible human when you put stuff around the Earth's atmosphere of thinking what happens to it afterwards um, and how that would work. Um, you know, and, and potentially, I suppose there's, there's a couple of options there, isn't there? You know, of how we clean up this stuff above our head, and I suppose it's a similar type of argument you have about the oceans and and how those get polluted and how we should clean those up as. Uh, members of the human race and, and inhabitants of earth so um look, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more clever person that's got a, a decision of how to clear those things up there but i certainly do appreciate our listeners uh feedback there on, on two different thoughts on on how these things should be done and uh fingers crossed um you know that, that solutions will come around to us okay one other piece of feedback here and uh dad i know you um had a, a message from uh, mike lewis uh mike uh, mike zero uh x-ray mike x-ray and uh he says uh love listening to you guys martin uh met edmund a few weeks ago whilst up in the peak districts up there in uh, the middle of the uk um and he said he just wanted to send on his thanks for the show so mike thanks a lot for your your kind message and uh, appreciate that and uh, yeah certainly just proves ice cube podcast presenters do get out and about and uh, it's great new call type of edmund there in the peak district of the uk well, as always, we'd like to thank our uh, donors who keep us advert free on the uh, the show. No one-off donors to thank this episode, but certainly our monthly donors who uh, keep sending their uh, their uh, subscriptions our way, showing their value for what we do is always greatly appreciated. You can uh, do your bit by visiting www.icqpodcast.com for slash donate, where there's lots of options there for you to show your value to the show. Congratulations again to George Thomas for becoming our homebrew hero for 2020. We do uh, uh, pass on our great congratulations to you from everyone at the ICQ podcast. And as I say, uh, you know, now we're, uh, as I say, look forward to uh, what you do with that over the next uh, 12 months. And of course, uh, potentially uh, a new war hero coming next year. So we uh, certainly look forward to how that develops. Our thanks go to uh, Leslie Golf Zero, Charlie India Bravo, Dan Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, Edmund Mike Zero, Mike November Golf. And a welcome return to Matthew, Mike Zero, 
November Julia X Ray for taking part in the news round table with your dad. So we do we do appreciate those guys taking part with you from there. Right, I think that just about wraps up everything from our notices point of view. Dad, just want to check in with you to make sure there's anything else that we need to cover off before we uh, uh, do our very important function uh, every time before we wrap up the show. No, no, I think we're pretty clear, Colin, and uh, it's quite interesting. A number of people talk to me now on the repeaters when I'm on my way home from work and say, don't forget to go and make Mrs. B a cup of tea and find her a chocolate biscuit. (laughs) And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm coming home from work and I'm making the tea, but I've been known as being Mrs. B's tea bitch for a long time, so I'll continue doing that, Colin. There you go. Well, on that very important note, let's uh, make sure you head off and uh, make that cup of tea and find a bicky. And uh, more importantly, we'll wrap up the show and uh, start planning the next one for a fortnight's time. So 73 is all. Yeah, 73. 